Hi everyone, and welcome back! It's been a hot minute since I've put out a video, and you might notice that things look a little bit different. I'm currently standing in my brand new lab, and as you can see, there have been some major changes. No longer am I working out of a 7x12 plastic walled box, the new lab is spacious, filled with brand new equipment, and ready for many years of amazing videos. It's not quite done yet, and just behind that door is the new workshop and several other rooms that are still being built, so a full lab tour will have to wait a little while longer. Today though, I want to talk about one specific piece of new equipment, which is essentially the crown jewel of the lab. This is an OT2, an amazing liquid handling robot that can automate a huge number of lab tasks. All professions have their tool sets, and biology is no different. But for the type of biology that I do, which is mainly genetic engineering and tissue culture, one tool reigns supreme, and that's a pipette. It's one of the first things that I pick up when I get working, and it's the last thing I put down at the end of a protocol. All genetic engineering really is is just moving small volumes of liquid around, and the pipette is the perfect tool for that job. It uses disposable tips so that every action that you do remains sterile, because the most important thing to genetic engineering is making sure your work stays sterile. Any contamination can ruin it. But even the perfect tool has room for improvement. The biggest issue with pipetting is that it's something you do both in high quantity and high volume. So let's take a simple DNA extraction for example. This is something where you'll usually have 6 to 10 steps that require a pipette. So that means 6 to 10 tips and 6 to 10 actions where you move liquid around. Now this is fine if you're doing one DNA extraction, but what happens if you have to do 12, or 30, or 50 even? All of a sudden it becomes something that is just extremely tedious and it might be all you do that day. Just the same steps over and over and over and over again. And because you're a human, you're a little bit slow and you can make mistakes, and it just takes forever, and by the end of it your hand is just sore from just the same actions just over and over and over and over again. It's tedious. And that's where the OT2 comes in. I've named it Kamaji after the boiler man from Spirited Away. And while I should probably demonstrate this by doing some standard lab protocol, I think instead we're going to have a little bit of fun and I'm going to teach it how to paint. Before that though, a bit of background. These robots are amazing and are used in real labs for super important tasks. For example, since the pandemic started, Opentron's built a pilot plant with several dozen robots that process COVID-19 test samples. The robots are grouped into sets of three, where each is a different station. All a technician has to do is load up the robot and then move the process samples between the three stations after they finish their respective tasks. And after the last robot, load the finished plates into the testing machine. With this system, thousands of tests can be processed per day in a single facility using a fraction of the number of people. The robot came packed incredibly well and each box had more goodies than the last. Also, full disclosure, this video was sponsored by Opentrons, so I got some extra bits and bobs to help me get started. However, notice the background in this clip? This was filmed at the old hackerspace I used to work out of. The robot actually arrived in December of 2019, but not too long after it arrived, everything went into lockdown and it sat in the old bio lab for months. I'd say it was collecting dust, but it was a clean room, so I guess just waiting? Eventually, I moved it into my temporary COVID workspace, but partway through filming, I finally managed to lock down a lease on a new lab space, and so filming was put on hold for several months while the new space was built. So you'll see clips from all three workspaces as this was filmed sporadically. The new lab is fully stocked with everything I'll need for many years of new videos. I've got proper work tables, the robot has its own dedicated space, I have proper refrigeration and freezers for storing all my bio stuff, and I've even got a minus 80 freezer now so I can store things properly. Eventually, the main work table will have a laminar flow hood built onto it, and I'm just waiting on the parts to arrive in the mail. And check out this massive fume hood. There are so many projects I'm just itching to get started on once the rest of the lab is built. I'm so frickin' excited to be in this new space, and it is radically changing the content that I can actually make. And this is just one room. Behind that door is the workshop, the hot work and welding room, and the additive manufacturing room. If you want to follow along with how the build is going, be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram where I've been posting fairly regular updates. And I'll be sure to do a very thorough tour as soon as it's done in a few weeks. But with that excitement aside, let's get back to the robot. The first thing I did once I got it and had a little time to play around was add a much needed feature, which as you can see, are some googly eyes. 
I'm thinking of maybe sticking a Kamaji face on here and maybe some little arm decals on the pipettes, but the robot is just so beautiful I kind of don't want to ruin it. It works a lot like a 3D printer and has a single arm with two slots for two different pipettes. I have a P10 and P1000 at the moment, so it can move 0.5 to 10 microliters and 100 to 1000 microliters. Eventually, I'm planning on getting a P300, which will do 10 to 300 microliters. The base has 11 slots where you could put different things, as well as a trash can. The slots fit a standard sized tip box, as well as special tube racks which come in different heights and tube sizes. A large portion of this robot is open source, so I actually printed my own tube racks on my 3D printer, rather than buying the injection molded ones, just to show that DIY components work just fine. The other thing that fit in here are various modules released by Opentrons that add more functionality. I have two of the three modules that they currently sell. The first is a heating and cooling module for protocols that need something, well, heated or cooled. And the second is a magnetic module that has permanent magnets in it that raise and lower to interact with magnetic beads used in various protocols. They also sell a PCR unit, which I don't have yet. Because the robot is open source and highly programmable, the next big video I plan to make with this is modifying it to add more functionality. I really want to see if I can turn it into a 3D bioprinter, but that's, let's be honest, a bit of a stretch. So I'm going to see if I can start by getting it to run gels, or maybe run an entire transformation protocol from start to finish without having me open the machine. But that'll be a lot of work, so it may take a while and a fair bit of tinkering. Currently, the robot is set up as a dead air box. Basically, what this means is that once you load everything in, there's very minimal airflow, so there's very little contamination that can get inside, but it's not truly sterile. They also sell a HEPA filter unit that goes on top of the robot that would actually make the internals truly sterile, which would mean you could do things like mammalian cell culture, which would open up a ton of wild projects. The robot is controlled either by a USB cable connected to a computer or over Wi-Fi. And Opentrons has both a whole GUI suite that lets you make programs for it, or a Python API that gives you much more fine control. Okay, with a basic overview of the device covered, let's turn it on and give it a whirl. Up until now, I've basically just been using the GUI, but for those future projects, I'm definitely going to need to bust out some Python. However, since I want to make the robot paint, I have to essentially trick the GUI into making it do what I want. Before we get into it, what do I even mean by making it paint? Well, in my last video, you saw this, which is my entire collection of fluorescent and chromoproteins being expressed in bacteria. My plan is to get the robot to put down little droplets of these colored microbes onto a petri dish and make colorful art. This is called agar art, and there are some amazing pieces that people have made online. The only difference is that I'll be getting my robot to do the work for me instead of using an inoculation loop like most people do. Instead of jumping right to bacteria and agar, I wanted to see if this idea would work at all, so I started with water and food coloring and had the robot deposit little droplets onto a flat plate covered in parafilm, which is like science grade cling film. Not only did this work surprisingly well, I was super impressed with how accurate the machine was. Each droplet was perfectly spaced apart and the robot managed it without much fuss. The only time a droplet wasn't where it was supposed to be was when there was a little wrinkle in the parafilm. It even made this little reminder to like the video if you're enjoying it so far. But for agar art, I need to make some modifications. First, I had a petri dish holder 3D printed that fits into one of the robot's slots. For the robot to know what this is, I had to design a custom piece of labware using Opentron's online tool. Basically, I lied to the program and told it that this petri dish was actually an incredibly shallow plate with lots of little wells in it, all aligned in a grid. I've put links to my GitHub repo where I've posted all the files I used for this project below. So if you want to try this yourself and happen to have one of these robots, be sure to check those out. One of the best parts of this robot is that you can easily share protocols between people. So all someone has to do is download the files, put the right tubes, racks, and modules in the correct spots, and the robot takes care of the rest. To actually make the robot paint, I of course will need some art supplies. For my canvas, as you've probably gathered by now, I'll be using petri dishes full of agar. I made a few different kinds. Some are just regular antibiotic plates, some have titanium dioxide mixed in to give a white background, and some have activated charcoal mixed in to give a black background. For context, the antibiotics are what makes the bacteria hold on to the colorful protein genes. If you'd like to know more about how that works, there's some links to my previous videos below. For the paint, as I said, I'll be using part of my collection of fluorescent bacteria. Rather than the whole thing, I just chose four to eight colors I like the most, since most of the colors are kind of samey. I just inoculated one milliliter of LB broth with antibiotics in it with the appropriate color. 
Now, at the time I was first filming this, I was starting to run low on tips and had heard of the idea of a tip washing station from a friend and wanted to try it out. I now have loads of tips, but still, washing tips could cut down on the lab waste, which is always a good thing. Basically, this would mean I could do a whole painting using only a single tip by sterilizing it between steps. This obviously wouldn't be a good idea for something like DNA extraction, where even the tiniest contamination is really, really bad. But if you're handling bacteria, it could be really interesting. And since I'm using various colored bacteria, it'll be really easy to see how well the washing steps actually work. To make my tip washing station, I just set up three tubes in two bracts, each with a different solution in it. The first is hydrogen peroxide, the next is 99% isopropanol, and the last is sterile water. This way, any bacteria in the tip are destroyed by the first two solutions and rinsed out in the last. For the cleaning step in the protocol, I just had the robot mix the liquid in each tube ten times and then move on to the next tube. Okay, this is my complete setup for making the painting. I've got my tubes of bacteria in the corner, the washing station behind it, and the petri dish in the middle. After calibrating, I set a fresh tip in the first slot of the tip box for the robot to work with. To actually design the paintings, I first found pixel art online, and then wrote a program to copy that design onto the petri dish. It was a bit painstaking because I was doing it by hand in the GUI, but once I get that Python API stuff working, eventually this will be much easier. To start though, I just had to make a series of nested squares of different colors. The first print was a little bit wonky, but the second was much better. There was a little bit of color mixing, but I think that's because of how close the droplets were to each other, and because there wasn't enough time between colors to let the last batch dry. I fixed this for the most part in later runs. I also lowered the amount of liquid dispensed for each droplet, which helped a lot. It took a few tries to get this to work, since the agar in the petri dish isn't actually perfectly flat, and the 3D printed holder was a little bit wonky. When you pour agar, it's still a liquid, which means it has a meniscus, so the surface of the agar curves a little bit. So as I set things up, I had to calibrate the dish to the lowest point of the agar. Basically, during calibration, I'd move the tip until it was at the lowest point on the agar, then lower it slowly until it just barely touched the agar, and then raise it up half a millimeter. The other issue I was having was that sometimes droplets wouldn't stick to the agar. So what I found was necessary was to add a step where the robot will wait for a moment after extruding the droplet to give it time to wet the agar and stick, as well as a blowout step where it pushes a bit of extra air through the tip to force the droplet out. Between these extra steps and getting the height adjusted just right, I was able to make some pretty great pieces. The other thing to notice is random spots of color elsewhere in the dish. One issue I had was the blowout step made microscopic droplets fly everywhere, so things grew in places they weren't supposed to. Mostly, it came down to how perfect my calibration was. If the tip was too close to the agar, it blew raspberries and made a mess. Too far, and the droplets don't stick. Now, I won't make you watch through an entire print, since each took about half an hour, but I will say it was very mesmerizing to watch. Sure, this isn't a mission-critical protocol or anything, but seeing how precise and repeatable the robot is was awesome. It was also interesting, because the droplets go down onto the petri dish as clear colorless liquid. So, even though I could see the pattern of droplets once they dried, I wouldn't know how the final painting will look until after it had time to grow. After each painting, I would let the droplets dry onto the dish before opening up the robot and putting a lid onto the dishes to keep them sterile. If the droplet pattern looked good, then I'd put the plate into the incubator to grow. But if something looked wonky or a bunch of the droplets didn't stick, I'd simply reset and redo the painting. Once I got the hang of this, it only took two or three minutes to reset everything and go again. Okay, let's see those paintings. Once I'd mastered the nested squares, I moved on to more complex stuff. I made a few rainbows, but as with all things computer, most errors occur between the keyboard and the chair. After the first time, I realized I'd forgotten to change the color of the last few rungs, so they all ended up green. But when I changed the program, I kept getting confused because of my poor naming scheme, and kept choosing the wrong file. But the rest of the paintings came out far better. I made this jellyfish on black agar, and you can see that different colors look different as I switch through different light sources. Some of the proteins that I'm using will respond to UV light, while others respond to blue light, and some simply are colorful in white light. Another that turned out really well is this Minecraft creeper face. Again, this one took a couple of tries to get right, but the end result was creepy indeed. Probably my favorite, though, was this old-school Link from Legend of Zelda. I only used four colors for this one, three for the figure, and then one for a border. The quote-unquote pixels came out super sharp on this one, which really speaks volumes about the accuracy of this machine when everything is set up properly. 
I'd say probably 100% of the wonkiness of the other paintings was because of the agar not being perfect, rather than any sort of issue with the machine itself. To be fair, this was not something the robot was ever intended for, so it's handling this weird task with surprising grace. But that's pretty much it for the paintings. I absolutely love this robot and have big plans for it in the future. Part of getting the new lab is going to be setting up an online store. I plan on selling some of the plasmids I've made, kits, and other cool bits and bobs. And this robot, along with some of the new tools, are going to make running that store so much easier. And like I said at the beginning, I do have plans to push the robot as far as I physically can, and do all kinds of interesting stuff. I don't know when I'll get to that or how long it'll take to make it work, but if I can get bioprinting working, I basically plan on printing myself a skull or maybe a set of antlers. Or if I can get the HEPA filter unit, this could be a great addition to the Neuron project, as it could be used to maintain the Neuron cultures autonomously, amongst so many other amazing applications. So if that sounds interesting, then you should definitely subscribe to see when all those videos are done and the new store goes live. Of course, I'll put links to everything, and if you're interested in getting one of these robots for yourself, I've put some links below where you can learn more. Before I wrap up, I need to say a special thank you to my amazing patrons, members, and supporters on Ko-fi that make these videos possible. Especially over the last couple of months, as I was focused on building the new lab, your support has been super important and meant the world to me. Supporters also get access to the supporter discord if that's something you're interested in, so if you'd like to help keep the flow of science videos coming, there's some links below. But for now, that's where I'll leave it. If you've enjoyed, you know what to do, like, subscribe, and leave me a comment of what you think I should do with the robot next. And of course, follow me on Instagram and Twitter to see updates of the new lab build, and all the new projects I'm working on long before the end of NVIDIA's. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.